You're not on the video. It's just my notes. Mm -hmm. And your voices, your free voices. Okay, so basically we will use these types of measurements and combine them together to make something called a derived unit. A derived unit just means that you take two things and you multiply them or divide them. It's really all it means. Derived sounds like it's really complicated. It's just a, cal a calculation. So density is one that you're familiar with, yes? Mass divided by volume. Give me something that has a really high density. Oil actually has a really low density because it floats on water, right? Lead. Lead will sink to the bottom. A lead sinker who goes fishing? I don't. I'm not going to raise my hand. So, yeah, lead has a really high density. It means that per volume it's got a lot of mass. It's very heavy. So we're going to do a lab with density tomorrow. Um, mass is usually going to be in grams. Volume can be in what or what? Liters. Or we can have grams per milliliters. What's another one where you would actually like maybe take like a rectangular prism and get the volume of that. Centimeters what? Cube, thank you. So it's got to be length times size times height with so it's going to be grams per centimeters cubed. So any of these units like this is considered density because it's still just generally a mass over any general volume. Area, you use area probably a lot in geometry and other places. Meters squared, centimeters squared, inches squared, but we don't really use inches either. So those are our derived units. We'll do a lot with this tomorrow. All right, when the majority rules and the majority looks like they're they're good, I can't go on. Hopefully that's the case here. Okay, these are a couple temperatures that you will need to refer to or just naturally know. The one we use the most is room temperature. So that's probably the most important one to write down if you don't know. Room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So in a problem, I might say, I'm heating a beaker. I wouldn't heat a beaker to 25 degrees Celsius. I'm heating a beaker from room temperature. And so I might not tell you what it is. You got to know what it is. And occasionally, I'll say, tell me room temperature, but tell me in the unit of Kelvin. All you do to the Celsius temperature is you add the magical number 273. I don't know how you remember 273. Once you use it a lot, it just like kind of you naturally on accident memorize it. So if you use it a lot, you will you'll start to learn, learn it. But all you do is take 273, you add whatever Celsius temperature it is that you're looking for, and this one's 298. So these two things are equal, it's just in different units. Body temperature, if, you, if you're sick, your mouth is a thermometer in your mouth, what, what's sick with a high fever? About 100 or 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit, so about 97, 98 degrees Fahrenheit is what we would normally eat. That's equal to 37 degrees Celsius. You don't have to memorize this one. This is one I could help you with. The room temperature we use a lot, so I'd like for you to know that one. Boiling water and freezing water. I think you know these. Yes? Okay, cool. I think you know them. You'll use these a lot when you get to phase diagrams. But you just need to know those so we can refer to them. And we all know what we're talking about. When I say freezing, I know it's 30, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's zero degrees Celsius. Water boiling is like 212 Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Celsius. We don't use Fahrenheit. Can I go forward? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. I can't read your minds. All right. You've heard of the metric system, yes? You do this in biology, earth science, physical science, whatever. You know the whole King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk? All right, there's an extension to that. I don't know who the king is, but anyway, he died. So King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk, and I'm going to tell you the extension right here. King Henry died by, five. five is the D, it's the base of drinking chocolate milk, dot, dot. And these dots are here because they're decimal placements. They are, sorry, micro, which I can't draw very well. Micro is a U with a tail in the front, okay? Nano dot dot pico. So it goes, King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk dot dot micro dot dot nano dot dot pico. So these are extensions to the metric system. So the, the way this works is it's just a big number line that tells you the placement of a decimal. Kilo 
is what your king is, right? So like in one, okay, if I have one meter, how many little meters are in a big, huge kilometer? Do you know that one? <laughs> Thank you. A thousand, I heard a thousand. The way that works is this right here, base is like a meter. How many spaces over to the left is a, is a kilo? Three, so that's three zeros. So it goes like this, one, two, wait, one, two, three. So the meters here, this can be also a liter or a gram. Those are kind of your base units. Anything to the left is gonna have, you're gonna have lots of little meters in one of these larger units. So one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. So how about one hectometer? How many meters? Hundred. And one decometer. Ten. See how the numbers go down? As you go to the right, or yeah, the right side of the base units, these are smaller units. So you know this. You know in one meter, meter stick. How many little centimeters are in one meter stick? Hundred centimeters. How many millimeters? A thousand. So I always refer to this because this is something like you're familiar with. You know what this how this works. So in these other ones, if I say, hey, all right, I got one meter, here's my meter again, I'm going to kind of go right here, one meter, how many micrometers or micrometers are in one meter? How many zeros away is the micrometer? These dots count, that's why I say dot, dot. Six, thank you. So it's one micro or one meter is equal to one one, two, three, four, five, six, also known as 10 to the six micrometers. So all you're doing is you're adding a lot of zeros. If you know that a micrometer or a micrometer is little, 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 you're gonna have a lot of them in one meter. Does that scale size make sense? Because like, you know, one meter has two zeros over 10, a uh, hundred centimeters, a uh, thousand millimeters. These dots count. So you have 10 to the 6 micrometers. So what's a nano? 10 to the 9. How do I remember nano 9? Both start with N. Okay, that's how I remember that one. So this one's 10 to the 6th over. This one's 10 to the 9th over. Pico, 10 to the 12th over. So anytime you're, you see those other those weird ones, just remember they're, they're always two dots and then the unit. Two dots and the unit, two dots and the unit. So these actually, these decimals here, they actually have names, but we don't deal with them too often, so I don't ask you to look at them and memorize them, okay? We'll do some examples with this. So you've always done conversions like this by just sweeping your decimal left or right, yeah? So like if I said, I have 53 kilograms, or grams, how many kilograms is that? What would you do? Move, that, move it over to the left or to the right? I mean, not two, three, it's actually three. three. To the left, I'm just making sure we're on the same page. The reason why is because you know how many grams are in a kilogram. A thousand grams are in a kilogram. That's not even close to a thousand, right? There's no way it's gonna be a whole kilogram. So you have to move it so that it's a smaller number. One, two, three, and then what goes in the space? A zero. So the answer is 0.5, I'm sorry, 0.0, Five, three kilograms is equal to 53 grams. You're going to have way less than a kilogram in those 53 grams. So that logically should make sense. Don't like just do the math and say, yep, done. Kind of think about the logic, the logistics of it too, and see if it makes sense to you. All right, you guys try the next one. Do your decimal soups. I'm going to show you that. Similar. 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 So if you have 9.84 liters, are deciliters smaller or larger than liters? Smaller. So you can have more deciliters in a liter or less deciliters in a liter? More. So which way are you moving your decimal? How many spaces? One. So deci is like a 10, so it's over one. So you have 98.4 deciliters. Are we okay with that? 
All right, I'm gonna show you another way. It's called dimensional analysis. I show you with the easy stuff because you can check your math by looking at your decimal swooping system here. What I like to do is to prepare you for stoichiometry, that's just like a fancy word for chemistry math, is to do it like this. So I'm gonna multiply it by something that's an equivalency. Well, earlier we were saying, okay, one liter is equal to how many deciliters? 10, so you just move your decimal over and you say there's 10. So if one liter is equal to 10 deciliters, I can take this as they're equal to one another, right? Like a dozen is equal to 12. They're just equivalencies. I can use it as a fraction because all I'm doing is once I put this into a fraction, I'm multiplying by something that's equivalent to one. Anytime I multiply by one, does it actually change it? No, I'm just gonna change the way it looks because I'm changing the units. So I wanna get rid of get rid of liters. So I'm gonna take this one liter, put it on the bottom. Those 10 deciliters goes on top. The reason why is because I am not asking for liters, I'm asking you for deciliters. So if I put liters in the bottom, anything on the top of a fraction and the bottom of a fraction, same units, what do they do? Cancel, right? So we got liters gone, liters gone, great. All you're doing is 9.84 times 10. What is that? 98.4, and the unit that's left over is deciliters. Do you understand this? Awesome, this is called dimensional analysis. It's fancy math. But you will use it like any really like crazy units when I start throwing out, I don't know, joules, and the joules are not jewelry. It's like a unit for energy. Stuff that you've never really been exposed to. If you know all you're doing is canceling units, you are golden, you are good. So if this makes sense, and this makes sense, we're good. We're gonna do some more of that though. Okay, I think you all should be very familiar with scientific notation. Let me know, I, I just try to gauge your, what you know based on this introductory lecture. Really large numbers are ridiculous to write. How many zeros are there? Too many to count, I don't wanna count all those. So if I did count them, I would count over by looking at the first couple numbers. Whenever you write something in scientific notation, these first numbers have to be between one and 10. So the first number here, what's the, well, all you have to do is move the decimal or actually make a decimal so that this first thing is equal to six. So it needs to be something between zero and 10. So when I convert this, I write 6.02, because I need something between 0 and 10, and then times 10 to however many decimals it takes me to get all the way over here. Okay, so if I counted this, this would, my first decimal would be right here, and I go blah, 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 23. Okay, so that's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Thumbs up, okay, with this. We will write stuff in scientific, scientific notation, because I do not want you to write out that many zeros. Waste your time. We also can make it so everything's really small, but everything will get there. Everything really small is something like, let's do this one. Write that one in scientific notation. Your exponent is going to be a positive number or a negative number. Negative. Make this one smaller than one. What's our thought process? What are you doing? What's your first number? 3. Point. And in this case, I'm going to write the rest of those because I don't know which of these are significant to my measurement, whatever the measurement is here. Because I don't have a unit, so I don't know. So I'm going to write them all, and then I'll tell you how to start truncating here. So 3.880983 times 10 to the negative third because if you put the decimal right here you have to show me that's not where it really is you got to move it back three so you just go boom 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 three back three back means it's a negative three x thumbs up if you're okay with this thank you thank you appreciate your thumbs up it's just i, I want to make sure we're okay with the easy stuff before we move on to some new stuff that you may not be exposed to um and i think we're okay with this so just give me that. all right so um who can volunteer and get me a piece of paper i need about 10 of you if you have a piece of paper, I need you to crumple it up to the wall. Okay.
the whole time yeah so it's got to be in the basket in the same area you can be accurate and precise you also can be just precise but not accurate okay so there the, these words we use interchangeably sometimes because people don't use them in the right way but I hope that little demonstration helps you recognize what those th those two words actually mean because sometimes I'll shoot this blank Two definitions you need to be familiar with. So it'd be great if we could be accurate and precise. That'd be great. But sometimes you can be just precise, that's good. Or actually you do have to be precise if you're accurate. Because if you're accurate, you're hitting that that basketball. You're hitting that the, the not bank shot. You're you're swooshing. You have to be precise if you're doing that too because you're obviously hitting the same spot over and over and over again. So you can be accurate and precise or just precise. Percent error. So we do a lot of measurements. Uh, we deal with a lot of data. Sometimes you're super, super precise. Like you measured it the same exact measurement every single time you did it, but your measurement was like 10 degrees off from mine, which mine may have been the accurate one. Or yours may be the accurate one. Doesn't matter. So there's a, some, just some discrepancy between the value I was looking for, called the accepted value, and the value you got in your experiment, called the experimental value. So if you ever want to co uh, consider your percent error, all you do is plug it into this equation. If you took your, accept, your experimental value, you take it away or minus your accepted value, it really doesn't matter which one you do on the top because it's absolute value. So what I like to do is I just go, a minus E over A times 100 is equal to percent error. So I'm just trying to see how far away my result was from the true value that I really wanted. What's a good percent error, you think? Something that means you are a fantastic chemist. Zero percent error would be awesome, but, you know, we got to work to get there. Two percent error is really good, right? So something that's a small error, like two percent error is good. Like a 98% error, better try that experiment again. That means you did something wrong. We will have some labs that will give you really, really good percent error, and you will just pat yourself on the back and just be so proud. But then you'll have some labs that are like a thousand percent error. It has happened. I'm not quite sure what they did in the lab, but it, it can happen. So sometimes we gauge ourselves on our abilities based on our percent error. So in our reading, your, you measure room temperature to be 28 degrees Celsius with your thermometer. What is percent error? What do you have to know? What's room temperature? 25. So I didn't tell you it, but you know accurately the accepted value is 25 degrees C. How do you do your percent error? Okay, so accepted, which is 25, right? Minus yours, 28. Oops, that's supposed to be a degree C. Over what? 25. Uh, it's the accepted value, so it's accepted minus experimental, which is your data, 
over the true value, and our fact is, is the 25, and then times 100. Absolute value in the top. So what's the top number? 3 over 25 times 100. I don't know what that percentage is. 12 point something percent. Yeah. So it's accepted minus experimental, not experimental. It can be either one. It doesn't matter which way you do it because it's absolute value. So if I do oh. if I do this minus 28, that's a negative 3, but then I take the absolute value of it, so it doesn't matter. What you have to remember, though, is it's accepted on the bottom. So, so the, the A on the bottom. Okay, I'm not going to go through this bottom one. I might do it tomorrow. It's just another explanation of uh, precision, precision accuracy. Can I go forward? Cool. All right, so significant figures are kind of the big topic of the day. I just want to go through some of the basic measurements. Um, all right, so say... Let's say I get on the scale and I step on it and I am oh, 309 pounds. Okay, so 309 pounds. And I say, I'm just going to tell people I'm 300. That's a lie, right? It's nine, nine pounds off. So what if my scale only measured, I don't know, to one significant figure? I would be telling the truth. So significant figures actually tell us how accurate our readings are in, in the line, any measurement you do, and it allows you to not tell people lies, and it allows you to give a better understanding of your measurement. It's not really anything new, it's just telling you how many numbers you can record. So in our case, we're always gonna tell all the values we know for sure in our measurements. So if you, if on those analytical balances back there, we can measure like 100.123 grams. That's some, some fancy scales back there for AP chemistry. So we can measure all the way out here to this final decimal. There is a number after this, after, I'm going to erase that graph for now, after that, that I don't know. I don't know it, so I don't ever look at it. Also, this number right here, it could be rounded. It could have been at the back here, one, two, two, nine. And the scale rounded it to three for me. Or it could have been point one, two, two, no, let's go one, three, four. And the scale rounded to me. Both cases, it's still rounded down to three, right? All right. So what the scale is telling me, that last number is is a lie. It's not a three. I don't know what it is. But so that last number is called our estimated digit. These one, two, three, four, five first numbers are true. That's not a lie. They're exactly that. That last number is estimated. It's rounded. So we report it just to have that last significant figure, but we don't know for sure that's it. So anytime you're measuring, you're going to go all, you're going to report all the numbers you know for sure, and then you're going to estimate the last digit. That's all significant figures are. So we'll do some practice ones. You write down what you need to here. It's just a way of telling the truth about your measurements is all this is. So if I'm looking at this awful ruler that only has one centimeter here and one centimeter here, I mean, most of the time we see rulers with all these little graduations on it. We're used to this. If you see a ruler like this, what do you know for sure how long this block is? You know it's at least one, but you don't really know. Is it one point something? You don't know what that, that next digit is. So we know it's one centimeter for sure. After that, let's go. Um, it's not about halfway, so what'd you guesstimate here? 1 point what? 1 point 3. So we're not really sure. We know the one for sure. The 3 is the estimate. Centimeters. And that's it. Now, that ruler sucks. I would never use that ruler. This ruler, I would use because it's more accurate. I'm going to have more significant figures. So the more significant figures you have or more numbers in your measurement, the more, more sure you are of that. So you're looking here like, okay, I know it's a 1. Then I'm looking... It's right there about. So what do we know for sure? We know it's for sure 1.2, but is it almost to the three? Almost there, so let's call it 1.2, estimate the next one, nine centimeters. So you write down what you know for sure, and then you estimate the last one, that's it. Cool? All right, um, some people have like really hard time with this. 
it's not horrible. Okay, this is on your lecture notes, you know, the half sheet I gave you yesterday. Um, send me that again. So I try to give you just a couple lecture notes so that you don't have to write down every living thing on the planet. This is the cutesy way of remembering which which figures, which numbers are actually significant, which actually means something. So like a significant other, you know, like they mean a lot to you. There I have numbers here that are significant figures because they mean a lot to you, they mean something. This is called the Pacific Pacific Atlantic Method. So where's the Pacific Ocean? Hold on, draw my US. Uh, Florida, Texas, California, Washington, Hawaii, Alaska. Okay, cool. So, that's, it looks, oh, looks awful. Okay, so the Pacific Ocean is where? Pacific Atlantic. All right, so this is called the Pacific Atlantic Method because all you're doing is if you look for a decimal, you look for a, num a number, you see where the decimal is. If there's no decimal, the decimal is absent, yeah? Absent means Atlantic. You start counting wherever your, whatever your number is. So for example, like four, I have no idea what the number is, but I have no, no decimal, all right, right? All right, so I'm gonna start from the Atlantic, which is the right side. What I do is I look from the Atlantic for the first non-zero digit. Am I there yet? Am I there yet? Am I there yet? There. How many significant figures am I counting? Just that one. So this huge number has one significant figure. Because all these other ones, they could be lies. There's no decimal. Like I don't know if this person just estimated, maybe it was like four, I have no idea what this one. One, two, three. What is that? Four trillion? Million? Billion? So four billion, or maybe it was four billion, four hundred and ninety-eight million, blah, 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 blah. They rounded down to four. So if there's no decimal, all I know for sure is that's a four up there, the rest of it's inaccurate. But if this number was this one, that means this person measured exactly four zero 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 zero. And that point right there tells me that this number is totally true. I'm not lying to you. Um, the decimal is present, right? Present Pacific. You start from the Pacific Ocean, start counting these digits, the first non-zero digit. So I'm here. When do I start counting? Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If I count it with the decimal, there's ten significant figures there. That means I'm a lot more accurate. Like, I am positively sure this number is true all the way to this last digit. Decimal means something. That's what I'm trying to get you, get you to see here. So it's called the Pacific Atlantic because you just count from the Pacific or from the Atlantic. It's absent, Atlantic, present, Pacific. Cool? Next slide. All right, we have some practice spots and you have it on your sheet. I think these examples, they're there on your sheet, yeah? Okay, uh, looking at the first one, I'll do the first three with you. First thing I say is, is it present or absent? It's present. Where do I start? Pacific. Present, Pacific. So you start here, start counting kind of the first non zero digit. Start. One, two, three. Three sig figs there. Next one. Present or Pacific? I mean, present or absent? Present. Start from the Pacific. One, two, three, four. Next one, present or absent? Absent, start from the Atlantic. And this one has a six here, so I do get to start that first non zero. So one, two, three, four, five. Five sig figs. So this one I was traveling to the that way, that way, and then this way. You guys are a little harder. Take a couple minutes to do that. On your paper.
was what we cannot do. I just brought up one example. F, okay. F has the decimal present, right? So you start from the Pacific. But when you start from the first Pacific, you cannot count as zero if it's in the very front. It's called a leading zero. You start counting at the first non-zero digit. So you're going, and you're going, okay. Nope, nope. All right, now I start counting. You start counting the five, seven, and the two. So there's three deaths or three numbers there that are significant. So you don't start counting until you see a non-zero digit when you're kind of tracing your finger across it. So it's like number, uh, so eight here, start counting at the, nope, 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 yes. Start counting the two, and that's the last one. So that's the one thing they number. So if the, if the decimal is present, you start from the Pacific. Absent, you start from the Atlantic. So like in G here, you start counting at the Atlantic, but you see a zero, nope, zero, nope. The four and the three count. So they're significant, they, they are true values. All right, let's do a couple more, but in a different way. I'm gonna skip these for now. All right, so anytime you're rounding something, all you do is you look and see how many significant, significant figures you're supposed to have in the number. You start counting from the Pacific side, and then you round the last digit. So if I want one sig fig in this big, huge number, the only number I'm gonna write down right now is a five, because that's my only first significant figure digit. Everything after this, I need it to be zeros, because one, I need to be zeros because if I put no decimal here and I read this number, that, 50,000, that's about 50,600, right? They're about the same. The scale should be really similar. But I have no other decimals, right? So it's absent. Where do I start? Atlantic, start counting. Nope, 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 nope. Yes, one sig fig. So I need to make this number work. I need to make it look similar to this one. And then I need to make sure it only has one sig fig. The next one, I'm going to put five. Scroll this up a little bit. Five and then something. I need it to have two sig figs in the end. I can put a zero there, but I still want it to be 50,000, so I, uh, I'm going to put the, the three zeros there. But doesn't that look just the same as that? All right, so that can't be true because that has one, this one has, I need to have two. What can I do? If I put a decimal there, that's five. I can't put a one. Well, actually, I could put a one. I'm going to put the one there, and then I'm going to show you how to adjust it using your scientific notation that you just kind of told me you knew how to do. So, what you do is, these are the first two numbers that you can record. However, doesn't the six affect that zero? So it, it rounds it up, right? So, I'm going to put 5.1 times 10 to the fourth, times 10 to the fourth. Because if I expand this out, this is now 51000. So, this has two sig figs, yeah. It's still about 50, 51,000, which is about the scale of that size, and there's only two sig figs. You can write this way or this way. Either way, the first two numbers here are the only important numbers. The first two numbers here are the only important numbers, the, the significant figures. Keep going. So, next one. I need three sig figs. Give me a guess. I got, I got it, Jared. So, 50,600. I start, I see that there's no decimal, it's absent, start from the Atlantic. Skip those first two, one, two, three. Good. What's another way of writing that? Scientific notation way. Right. So I like to do scientific notation because all I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this first section here to include a couple more digits. I prefer that way because it's just easier. Four sig figs. Um, I need to double check. Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. Four sig figs. 5.06. If it, I can't see, I got one, two, three, four. This is the number that's estimated. Does that zero influence that zero? Nope, still gonna, still gonna be zero. So 5.00, or sorry, 5.060 times 10 to the fourth. All I'm doing is making it more accurate because I'm including more digits. So the cell, let's do the seventh one. Seven sig figs, go for it. So I see here I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So these are the only numbers I'm concerned about. Does that seven influence that six? What's it do to it? 
rounds it up. So I can actually record that number, just truncate it and uh, round it up. So 50600.07. There we go. This is just a, a fancy way of rounding. I know it seems really silly that I'm telling you this, but whenever you have to um, add and subtract significant figures or multiply and divide, rounding is important. So I just want to make sure we're okay with rounding. We'll practice this though some more. Okay. okay. These are rules that are also on your sheet. Make sure you see them. Put a star by these. These are ones that you need to memorize. This is how you use significant figures when you're adding or subtracting numbers or measurements and then multiplying the dividing. So, anytime, so, okay, who runs cross country? Top cross country. Maybe you know if you're a So, if you are on a swim team or you have a relay team or anybody, there's one person that's the weakest link. That would be me in the relay races, like, trying to pass the baton, okay? So, there's one person who's the weakest link. And anytime you're adding, multiplying, anytime you're doing math and chemistry, there's one measurement that's your weakest link. It's the number that has the least significant figures. It's the least accurate. It's going to hold you back. It's not going to be very accurate. And it's going to hold back the whole entire calculation. So when you're adding, I'm sorry, when you're multiplying, dividing, you find the measurement that has the least number of sig figs and count them. That's the final answer sig figs. So like if I was adding 1.1 plus 1.11 plus 1.11111, Who's my, I'm sorry, not my adding, I'm multiplying these. Who's my weakest link? 1.1, how many sig figs? Two sig figs. So in the end, I would add these up, which is like 3.32 and et cetera, okay? So I can add these up, but my final answer can only have two sig figs in it. So I've got 3.32 right now. What do I round it to? 3.3. That's how the rounding works. 3.3 is the only accurate numbers you have. We'll call it six meters. All right, so that's what you do for multiplying. Uh, I'm sorry, I added them again. That's cool. So if you multiply them, it would be a different number. But multiplying and dividing, you count the weakest link, and you use that same number as your significant figure number in your final answer. For adding and subtracting, you don't count sig figs per se. You count decimal places. So in this same example, let's pretend it's adding this time. How many decimal places are here? One here, two here, five. So in this case, you have one decimal place, which is your weakest link. So your final answer would only be recorded to whatever the number is and then one decimal place. So you look and see where your weakest link is and you, and you use that on your final answer. That's it. So let's do some examples of this one. Okay, so first one, it's multiplying and dividing, right? Look at your two measurements. Who's the weakest link? Which one? 12.7 milliliters. This one has three sig figs. This one has five sig figs. So when you do that, I got you here. I part of my math. That number, when you take this divide by this in your calculator, is 0.8722, I think, grams per milliliter. However, I need to round this to only include how many sig figs? How many? Three. And in multiplying and dividing, you count the lowest number of sig figs. So I got three sig figs here. I need to round this. So round that for me. 0.872 grams per milliliter. So all I did was I saw that this two was lower than five. See how that affects that number? It doesn't do a darn thing, so I'll leave it like that. All right, uh, let's do another one. Let's do B. How many sig figs in this one? How many? What's your thought process? Absent or present? At absent, start from the Atlantic over here, right? Start counting at the four and then the one. So there's two sig figs. So I got two sig figs here, two sig figs here. They're both weak, so I'm going to include two sig figs in my final answer. So 140 divided by 35 is, I'm sorry, multiplied is what? Anybody? Huh? 4,900. Okay, so you did it round that way? Was it exactly that? I only have my rounded answer here. Regardless, whenever you calculate it, it might be a larger number, but you only need two sig figs in your final answer. These zeros are not significant. And then the unit for this? Square. Thank you. Anytime you multiply your units, you square your units. Yeah. I just put the unit there. Yep. 
Because um, if I don't write the zeros, it's going to look like 49, right? Yeah. And I need this number to represent the, lar the large number that it is. Because I know that 140 times 35, there's no way it's 49. So I still need to represent the magnitude. It's still like a couple thousands. I need to represent the magnitude by putting those zeros in the end. Yeah. If you put a decimal on some that number, it make it four significant figures. If you put the decimal right there, it would be four significant figures. I'm going to take that off. All right, I like this. This is a good conversation. All right, so let's do an addition and subtraction. Let's do, let's do a C. Okay, so addition and subtraction, what's important? Decimals, okay, how many decimals is this one? One decimal. This one, two, this one, weakest link is one. So I record whatever this answer is with one, one decimal. When you add this up, you get 42.78 centimeters. I need to round that, right? What's the rounded significant number? 42.8 centimeters. Cool. Let's do one more just for kicks and giggles. Let's do this one. This is H. This is also an addition problem. How many um, decimals here? Three. Three. Four. Four. Three. three. Weakest link? Three. three. So whatever this number is, which is 0. 0.1075 liters, rounded would be what? 0. 0.108 liters. Right. All right, so key here, multiplying and dividing, you count sig figs, find the weakest link, addition and subtraction, you count decimals, and that's the weakest link. Yeah. Yep. yep, and then just make sure that you don't put a decimal there because it's going to mess up the number of sig figs it should have. Okay, and I got, got a couple more things for you. I'm going to skip some of these because I think we are getting the hang of it. Um, oops, okay. I know you know the density formula. I just want to make sure you're really prepared for your lab tomorrow. Can you guys do this first example for me? Do you want to take this in place? thought process so far. You're reading. I don't I don't like to reread that problem over and over again. Right when I start reading, I start writing down only the important pieces I need. What's the first important piece I need? Yes. Math. So M is equal to 152.2 grams. Keep reading. Blah blah blah. Each of us within length are three centimeters. So I got I've got a rectangular prism here, right? How do I find the volume of that? So volume is equal to length times width times height. What do I know so far? Three centimeters times three centimeters. Next one, two centimeters. Okay. I only do this because I just want to make sure you see my process here. Okay. So what's the volume? 18 what? Thank you. So make sure you give me your unit, okay? All right. How do I do this problem? All right. So mass over volume. So density is equal to mass over volume, which is 152.2 grams divided by 18 centimeters, which is equal to something like 8.455 grams per centimeters cubed. All right, this is where it gets tricky. What was our weakest link? Okay, um, did I record 18 okay? Double check my math. So I know this is fine. This is just simply a measurement. There's four significant figures in it. How many sig figs should, been, should have been in the volume? One. Because it says three. That's one sig fig, right? Three times three times two. So that's one sig fig each. When you multiply, you count the weakest link of sig figs, yeah? This one should be rounded to one sig fig. What would be that rounded? 20. So it's got to be two, and then that zero is not significant. So whenever you do your math, I don't want you to put 20 in this. I want you to think about how many sig figs should be in your final answer. So as you go, you're like, okay, I got four sig figs. And then here you're like, okay, I should have one. I'm going to keep the 18 because if I round in the middle of the problem, it's totally going to screw up your answer, right? You don't want to round too early. 
So I'm gonna put that like that or just maybe someplace right one sig fig. I don't want you to rewrite the 20 because it's not true. I know I need one sig fig. So over here you say, okay, I got four sig figs here and technically I should have one sig fig here. Final answer should have how many sig figs? One, because that's my weakest link. Round this to one. Eight grams per centimeter cube. That's your final answer. So don't change this number. I want you just to record this one to the correct sig figs. That's it. Okay, so it's kind of a thought process. Like you do the problem, then you go back and track your sig figs and make sure you can do it correctly. Next one, and then this will be the last one hopefully for the day. So that's if you have the like a you know a regular saw, uh, geometric figure and you can do the uh, volume doing length times width times height. How do you do the volume of a cylinder? So, so area of the circle times the height, or pi r squared times h. Okay, geometry, right? Okay, um, or math too. What is that? What geometry? Math too. I'm still getting used to the whole math thing. All right. So now, what I give you a rock. You don't have this perfectly cylindrical rock. How are you going to find the volume of that rock? Water displacement method. Please note that because I will be doing the last part, and I don't want to have to remind you. So. Reading, uh, okay, I see first thing, mass. Mass equals 45 grams. The volume of the rock is calculated using water displacement. The original volume of the graduated cylinder was 60. So what you do is you fill up your graduated cylinder, cylinder to some number under 100. Because if it's at 100 and I put something in it, what's going to happen? Over 100, and there's no graduations above 100, so I have no idea what I just captured. So you got to put something below 100, right? All right, so now I put the rock in there. The 60 goes up to 75. What's the volume of the rock? 15. So you would have seen the displacement, the, the amount that was displaced. So the volume equals 15 milliliters. How do I get the density? I see you. Okay. Mass, time, mass over volume, 45 grams over 15 milliliters equals... Three grams per milliliters. I would give you most of your credit there. I'd count off half. Why? I put one sig fig. How many sig figs should it be? Two. Two. And true, yeah, well, this is probably going to be like 75.0. So that actually might have three sig figs in it, but it doesn't matter. Your 45 is your uh, two sig fig one. So this should be 3.0 to be truly correct. It's kind of nitpicky, but it'll make you a better, a better chemist, okay? Make you a better scientist because you won't be lying to people about your accuracy of your numbers. Um, one more thing. What's the density of water? One what? One density. Okay. And this can also be written as one gram per. If I took, a, if I took some water and I made it in a cute little cube, how would I get the volume of that? Yeah, thank you. That'd be length times width times height of the or size cubed on the cube itself, so the per centimeter cube. So one centimeter cube of water is equal to one gram of water. Know the density of water. That's something you should you should be able to use. All right. The rest of your lecture notes. Take the rest of class. That you have to do that five and to practice on a couple of just on the left side of your paper. Practice a couple more of those that you skipped in between. And I'll pull up complex for the A's and get done with that and you can start that at least a couple times. Maybe.